What I was asked to do was think about where we've got to with the mental capacity act. It's not 10 years, it was 11 years yesterday it came into force, so we can all have some happy birthday song. Uh, what we've learned, where it's going, and a few gaps. So, without any further ado, oh, by the way, I'm Alex, I'm a barrister, I obsess about this sort of thing. Um, let's get stuck in. Can I just make it a caveat, though? Some of you know I was on secondment to the Law Commission where I worked on a mental capacity and deprivation liberty project. I'm now the lawyer on the Independent Mental Health Act Review. What I'm saying here is personal. It is not re reflecting either of those roles. I know it sounds like I'm a civil servant. Um, in this, I am. I'm also not allowed to comment on what's going on with the bill before Parliament. Those of you who know me know that is something I find problematic, that I'm not allowed to comment on it, but I'm not allowed to, so please don't. Uh, try and draw it out of me. I become exceedingly and worryingly good at evading questions. So, right, let's just take a, take a look in the rearview mirror. I'm sure you all remember March 2014, the big week in the MCA's life. There was the House of Lords Select Committee, its report, its post legislative scrutiny report on the MCA. And then precisely a week later, because Lady Hale was not stupid at all, and she knew when to time a judgment, she handed down Cheshire West. So, what did the House of Lords Select Committee said? Well, it's really important to remember this, because people remember the Select Committee report and also Cheshire West for dolls, it's all rubbish, everything's bad. And one of the terrible things about Dole's and Cheshire West is it now very many people, when they think of the MCA, think, oh, it's a headache, oh, it's about deprivation liberty, oh, it's a pain, with blowback against, actually, the important stuff at the beginning, the principles, what it means to have capacity or lack of capacity in best interest. We'll talk about this. And the House of Lords said it was a visionary piece of legislation for its time, marking a, marking a turning point in the statutory rights of people who may lack capacity placing the individual at the heart of decision-making, a step change in the legal rights afforded to those who may lack capacity, with the potential to transform the lives of many. That was the aspiration, and, um, and we endorse it. That's what we were trying to do. And that's, well, what we're still trying to do. That's what the point is. But, of course, we have learned quite a lot in the last 11 years. So should we sort of stampede through together and see what it is that we've learned? First of all, capacity is pigging, and if this wasn't being recorded, I would use a different word, difficult. It is genuinely really difficult. Of course, don't overplay the difficulty. There are many cases where it's crashingly obvious that the person has got capacity, and people are just ignoring that because it doesn't fit with what they would like to do. There are also other situations where it's crashingly obvious with a little bit of time and a little bit of attention and a little bit of support, the person could be enabled to make their own decision. But people aren't able or don't feel willing to give that time or that support. But it is actually the case. It is not always straightforward. There's increasingly empirical evidence about this. So it's not just gut feeling. This, I just thought it might be helpful just to give you a, a quick uh, sneak preview. There's a big welcome trust funded project at the moment, ongoing out of King's College London, which I'm part of, looking across a whole range of things connected to mental health and justice under essentially the twin theme, uh, themes of empowerment and protection in the mental health zone. One of its strands is difficult or contested capacity assessment. So we're looking in England, reflecting back on New Zealand and Scotland to help us think about why in some situations, capacity is difficult to give tools to enable people to do it better. So we've done a big review of all the cases in the Court of Protection where capacity has been an issue. We've interviewed psychiatrists, lawyers, and judges, and I can tell you interviewing the judges has been extraordinarily interesting. I can't tell you anything more about it because it's not public yet. It has just been really fascinating. And as one, and there's a big article coming out in the International Journal of Law and Psychiatry quite soon, looking at how the courts have looked at it. And just a few things which will reinforce, these are the judges. So these are the people where it's difficult or there is a dispute, this is the top of the food chain. So if they are finding these issues difficult, 
this is recognised and that many of you will also, in day-to-day -day practice, encountering people who may lack capacity. These are difficult issues. The judges regularly fail to consider practicable steps. Slightly concerning. Very regularly, the judges don't consider the causative nexus. I'm not going to embarrass people by making them put their hands up to say who's heard of the causative nexus. That's the bit which says you lack capacity if you can't understand, use, weigh, retain, whatever the information, because of the impairment or disturbance. And unless in any assessment you can explain why the person can't do that because you have not produced an assessment of whether or not that person lacks capacity. And the judges are only on occasion grappling with why is this person unable to make this decision? I'll come back to that. Embarrassingly, some of the judges haven't actually said what functional inability they rely on. So they said this person lacks capacity to decide where they live, but they haven't actually said why, because they can't understand, use, way, retain. I mean, that's a pretty embarrassing error. So those are slightly embarrassing things. Obviously, or one, where it gets tricky, is partly the language. And one of the reasons we're doing the project is if you ask 10 different people, they will give you 10 different explanations as to what they think understand information means. The judgments make it clear the judges are interpreting it differently. Is it a very basic thing? Can you understand, can you just grasp there is a thing called a care home? Or is it, can you put that bit of information together with the fact you might need to go into one? So we still actually don't have an agreed definition of what understand actually means in real life. And one of the things this project is recognizing is that you need to ask different questions for people with different sorts of conditions. You need to ask different questions in order to get whether a person with learning disability understands something to the sort of questions you'd need to ask with someone with an acquired brain injury. So there's work to be done translating the legal language into actually stuff which works on the ground. And then crashingly, obviously, use and weigh is the most problematic area. It's the area where it's easiest to say this is a 50-50 decision and bluntly you could have spun a coin, flipped a coin, and come up with an answer that the person had capacity. Because it's the one where it's the easiest conflation of this person is not making the decision that I would make. This person is not using information in a way I would use in way information. Therefore, they aren't, can't use in way information. Therefore, they lack capacity. It's a very, very easy road to take because of the way the, the act is structured. I'll come back to, in a minute into how we might avoid it. So just to flag up, these are the judges grappling with it and finding it difficult. So I was told to give lessons and challenges. One of the lessons is that the judges find it difficult as well. So how do we get it right? Having just ranted at you how difficult it is. Well, a few fairly obvious points. And this isn't a day about capacity or a day about best interests. I do, do days on both if people are interested. So I'm not flogging my services. I have lots of other things to do. But I genuinely am hugely bothered about how people on the front line actually, their level of legal confidence. Because if they're not confident legally, they have no hope of navigating the ethical dilemmas which come up the entire time in this zone. So, well, just thinking about getting right, assessment starts miles before the meeting with the person. Miles before. If the thinking process starts on walking into the room and meeting the person, disaster has already struck. Because you're in the middle of a random chat with somebody, as opposed to the process of who should undertake it? Who is the best qualified person to do this? Not the letters, but the skill set. What actually is the decision? Unless you actually know what the decision is, you can't put into the equation what is the information that's relevant to the decision or the information that is irrelevant. And really, one of the big themes that's come out of the interviews we've done is how quickly you are, people can skew capacity assessments by overloading it with irrelevant information. So you need to get the person to be able to 
say every single possible thing about actually something which is a very simple decision. You've automatically loaded it against them. But sometimes there might be things where across the board it may appear a routine decision, but there's one specific factor about where this person's going to live which is out of the ordinary that they need to be able to know and to be told and understand. Location and timing, well, that's sort of fairly crashingly obvious. Who should be present, really important. Because in many situations, having the family member present is absolutely what you need to do to get the person comfortable, to able to assist in a communication. But of course, are you confident when you're doing the assessment the family member is actually faithfully trying to relay and interpret what the person's saying? Or are they either giving you their own message or coercing the person into giving a message? One person's supporter is another person's manipulator. But it means you can't just have a blanket policy, must always speak to this person by themselves, never have a family member, always have an advocate. Because you aren't necessarily doing the comply with the duty to take all practicable steps to support the person to take their own decision. Values and assessment just to come back to using and weighing. The King's College case is such an important case. I really recommend you read it. The judge gave a really clear explanation of how the law works in a context with very stark consequences. Did this woman have the capacity to refuse renal uh, dialysis following an attempt on her own life? If she has the dialysis, she will live. If she does not, she will die. She says, I don't care, I don't want this treatment. The doctors could save her. She has got what they think of and they accept is edgy, is narcissistic personality disorder. They think they have got overly concrete thinking, I don't care about this, I don't want it. Emotionally, uh, narcissistic PD, they think they have got functional inability, diagnostic problem equals lack of capacity. They're very good doctors, and they know that is a very sketchy line of reasoning, but they have got someone in their hospital they could save. So if they do the right thing, and they come to court and say, please, judge, tell us this lady lacks capacity, this woman lacks capacity. And the critical thing in that case was the evidence of her adult daughters saying, we love our mother very much. This is exactly the sort of ghastly, self-centered thing she would always have done. This is just her. And the judge said there is a vital difference between being unable to use and weigh information and being able to use and weigh it and just doing it differently, according to a different value set. In this case, she was perfectly able to use and weigh the fact that she would die. She just didn't care. The learning point for us, for the judges, and for us, for anybody, is you have got no hope in using and weighing situations unless you know your own value set. Unless you're transparent and honest with yourself, social workers, psychiatrists, doctors, nurses, they spend their entire time being self-reflective and not ruling out police people and other professionals, but those professions are particularly self-reflective. What level of risk would you tolerate? How do you f strongly do you feel about the sanctity of life? Unless you know that, you can't begin to engage with somebody as to whether or not they're able to use and weigh information. And also, wherever possible, you need to try and put this in a longitudinal picture. Who is this person? Is this completely out of character? Or is just this, this person's personality speaking? So, we also have learned there are some real flashpoints in relation to capacity. Capacity and vulnerability is really problematic when there is a third party involved. And I'll come back to one of the big gaps we've got at the moment, at the end. Because unless, a, unless you can say the person's inability to decide whether the exploitative lodger should remain in their house is because they have an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain, that person does not lack capacity. So no best interest decisions could be taken in the ambit of a safeguarding 
decision or safeguarding process to say, let us take steps, for instance, to move this person from the home or more usefully, get rid of the lodger. Unless you can show their inability to decide whether they should stay there is because of the impairment or disturbance. Lots of these cases, there is the interaction, the mild dementia, the mild learning disability and the ghastly third party. What is it? Is it that they've got capacity but are being coerced? Or is it that they lack capacity? Those are two completely different people legally. And that, that slide goes into it a bit more detail and I'll come back to it. But it's a really important point and in this context it's one of the most difficult areas. Are we talking about coercion and control in relation to a capable person or are we talking about coercion and control in relation to someone who actually lacks capacity? It's one of the biggest issues that we've discovered in this context over the last 11 years. The other big issue, and I, I will come back to it at the end, the other big issue that we've discovered is really difficult is fluctuating capacity. One of the reasons it's difficult is it's not something that's in the Mental Capacity Act. There's some glancing references it in the Code of Practice, but if you read the MCA Code of Practice, as I know you all sleep with it under your pillows, you will remember the stuff about fluctuating capacity has got nothing to do with fluctuating capacity at all. That is actually about taking steps to wait until a person on an upward trajectory is at the highest point. That's not fluctuating. Fluctuating is someone where there is a real recognizable pattern. It goes up and down. The Dole's Code of Practice says, oh, it's all a bit complicated, just be pragmatic. Which, of course, is true, because if you think about it, capacity is time-specific. If, for purposes of Dole's, you must lack capacity to consent to being, or to live in that place and receive that care, Actually, if you've got dementia and you fluctuate, you're what the horrendous phrase sundowner, better in the morning than in the afternoon, really, they should be having their capacity assessed minute by minute. A continuous questioning. Is this person agreeing to be here with capacity? Are they deprived of their liberty? That would be cruel, horrible, and unusual. So we don't. We just go, eh, let's sort of take a bit of a broad brush. But it is really genuinely problematic. Which is one of the reasons why, and it's actually terrifying, the courts have not thought about this properly until this year. There was an, an unusual case called CDM about a woman with um, emotionally unstable bipolar, dis uh, un uh, emotionally unstable personality disorder and very, very poorly controlled diabetes. And she genuinely has fluctuating capacity to make decisions about her diabetes. Quite an unusual decision from the first instance court, basically saying, but accepting the evidence of a psychiatrist, that the only way you can tell this woman lacks capacity is judging the wisdom of her decisions. If she's making sensible decisions, she's got capacity. If she's making unsensible decisions, she lacks capacity. That case, perhaps unsurprisingly, is going to the Court of Appeal, because that, you could sort of see why the doctor was saying that, but there's not a very coherent, that's not, it's a slightly problematic way of approaching capacity. So I'm now in the case, and the, the, the permission to appeal was granted specifically, the court said, to work out what the approach should be to fluctuating capacity. But can I just make one simple practical suggestion? Try and work out, when you know the person is well, what it is they would like to happen when they are not well. Because then you are in far less trouble having to go, oh my goodness, I'm trying to make best interest decisions for this person in the hours, minutes, days, weeks, when they lack capacity, because you've got a plan which reflects them when they consider themselves to be well. So that's the only practical solution, and frankly, that's by far the best solution, whatever lawyers spend their time wandering around doing like me. Actually, the practical solution on the ground is that. But then, as I say, legally it's complicated because the MCA just didn't grapple with someone who's genuinely fluctuating. 
So dump capacity is all very difficult. Best interest is now much easier, luckily, in reality. Because we have, I'm not going to tell you the story of this again, because enough of you have heard this case before, but just to remind you of this paragraph, the single most important paragraph from the courts since the MCA came out. Lady Hale in the Aintree case. What is the point of the best interest test? To consider matters from the person's point of view. Try and work out what they would have done, what is important to them. If we can work that out, that is the starting point in making the decision for that person as an individual human being, right for them as an individual human being. All the judges now will say, I am, in, in these difficult best interest cases, mostly medical treatment, will say, I am trying to follow Lady Hale and put myself in the shoes of P. Constructing the decision from P, working outwards. It isn't quite as simple, it is really important. It's not quite as simple as say, find out what they would have done and do it. I mean, in medical treatment cases, should they have the treatment or not, it actually comes pretty much straight to that. But in all other situations, it's find out what they would have done. If you can be confident that you know, you would do it unless you have a good reason not to. I mean, you can frame this in legal terms as respect for autonomy. You could frame it in all sorts of things. Basically, it's fundamental human decency. If you know what this person would have done, why on earth would you not do it unless you had some legitimate reason not to do it? I would point out, I'm going to have, I can't resist saying this. I would point out that the Law Commission said this should be put on a statutory footing, place particular weight on a person's wishes and feelings. The government in March said, we agree, this is already good practice, we agree this should be enshrined in law. They have decided it doesn't need to be in the liberty protection safeguards. You can read the rationale for yourself and decide whether or not you agree. But the government certainly in March said, this should be enshrined, enshrined in statutory law because it is already what people should be doing. And I can guarantee you that whatever iteration of the code of practice comes out next, it will definitely be talking about this because the government seem to want to place a lot more reliance on codes of practice than they do on the statute. That's, that's what they've said. Of course, if we are in a world where we need to start with P and work outwards, it has a series of consequences. Because what, well, first consequence, please don't make them up. Don't make up the person's wishes and feelings out of some kind of misguided sense of, I need to do the thing that this person would have done. You wouldn't, but it does mean you've got to be good at critically assessing the evidence. This is a really good example, the top one, RY. I am not going to embarrass myself uh, by pronouncing the name of the health board. It's a Welsh health board. Guy was in a minimally conscious state. He was having deep suctioning through a tracheostomy, extremely painful. The word torture was used at one point. I think that's a bit OTT, but it was definitely painful, but it was definitely keeping him alive. The question was, should he, was it in his best interest to continue having this deep suctioning? Trust was very edgy about it. His daughter, his adult daughter, said, R.Y. would have wanted treatment so long as it kept him alive, no matter how uncomfortable. And it was, keeping him alive. Intensely uncomfortable, but keeping him alive. And the judge said, I would love to be able to say, I have reliably identifiable wishes and feelings here, as essentially my moral compass. My problem is that I just don't believe you, daughter. There are a couple of very case-specific reasons which we don't need to go into, but the, the main thing he said, which is important across the board more generally, is you're projecting. You so badly don't want your father to die that when you're telling me what he would have wanted, you're actually giving me your views. I'm not blaming you, I'm not critical, I'm just, that is clear. R.Y. was of an age and a culture where he simply would not have dis discussed things that private with anybody in his family. So he said, I am left in the position when I have to make this decision with no reliably identifiable wishes and feelings. It's very easy if you're talking to someone who's got the overt agenda. 
I want mum to go into the care home so I can flog the house and get the money. I mean, that's really easy. What's not easy is when the agenda is one that the person themselves don't realise that they have. Misplaced zeal or misplaced enthusiasm or projecting like here. But again, this is just critical assessment of evidence. This is not a different skill to the stuff that you do day in, day out. The second case is just to remind you that be careful as to, if, if, if you're talking about wishes which were expressed before the person lost capacity, think about the circumstances under which they were expressed. There, this was a statutory will case, make it will for P, and it was said that she'd said different things about who should get money at different times. One of these traditional ghastly cases where warring families in a fa warring, warring factions in a family. And mysteriously, every time she was staying with one faction, she should say the money would go to one lot, and when she's staying with the other lot, the money should go the other way. And the judge said, well, you can't possibly start relying on those wishes and feelings unless you've actually interrogated the extent to which she was coerced into saying any of this stuff. The other bit is, and that's just to point you to an article, and I'll show you the, my website at the end where you can find all this stuff for free because I care about you getting information. I don't care about you paying stupid amounts of money to Lexis. Um, sorry, sorry, Lexis. Uh, <laughs> what happens where you've got a situation where somebody had a whole life with unimpaired capacity and they now have impaired capacity? They've got dementia. They've had a brain injury. And what we know about them pre-accident, pre-onset of illness, demonstrated a particular course of action. What they're now doing looks completely different. The devoutly Jewish person who always kept kosher is now in a care home and is actively seeking out the pork sausages. Not being fed them because the care home staff are just being lazy and they're not trying to be culturally appropriate. What do you do? Do you say you take their past wishes when they had capacity and that trumps their present feelings that they're wanting this? Or do you say that's just inherently cruel this person's got dementia. They have no memory of who they were. And they can't understand why they're being stopped from eating this. I mean, it's proper ethical dilemma stuff. Uh, and the MCA gives you no help whatsoever. It really doesn't, because it says, in making a best interest decision, you consider the past and present wishes and feelings. If they'd had a written statement made with capacity, that is higher in the food chain. But still, it doesn't necessarily, unless it's an advanced decision to refuse treatment, in which case there's no best interest to be done at all. That is their decision, and it's binding if it applies. So there are some really ethical dilemmas to grapple with, and I, because I, I can never work things out without writing about them. I wrote about it with two students of mine from King's, and you can find it on my website or in that journal. And I think one of the answers is, in some situations, you just say, the past and the present clash so much We've got no identifiable wishes and feelings. And then you go, thank goodness, MCA, for giving us a set of principles at the beginning. Because at that point, you say, what are we trying to achieve? I don't know what you're trying to achieve in any given situation. But then, can I achieve that in a way which is less restrictive of the person's rights and freedoms? You've got that principle which helps you through thinking morally about and ethically about what the right decision is. So, just to flag up a couple of other things about best interests. It is a choice between available options. We have now, finally, in 2017, last year, had clarified. There is industrial level confusion about the interaction between the CARE Act, public law decision making about how you assess and meet someone's needs, and MCA decision-making, how a choice is made between the available needs. And unless you start with the CARE Act, or the NHS framework if it's CCG stuff, and you've got the framework, you are in complete confusion. It's really problematic to go, oh, this person's got impaired capacity, therefore everything about them is a best interest decision. No, it isn't. And if you're framing everything as a best interest decision, you are A, wrong, and B, you are leading people up a garden path which is likely to lead 
to long and expensive proceedings in the Court of Protection on a completely false premise. That's what happened in this case. After 18 months, the parents were told this option was never on the table. We would never fund it wearing our public law hat. And it's not surprising the Court of Appeal said, Supreme, this was the Supreme Court next iteration, but it's not surprising the Court of Appeal said, these parents had the rug pulled out from under them. Incidentally, the public authorities had wasted tens of thousands of pounds on legal fees when actually, if they'd actually thought about it at the beginning, they'd have said, this option of paying for this particular visiting program is never going to happen. Wearing our public law hat, we will not fund it because it's not necessary to meet this person's needs. They, if they didn't like it, the parents, what they should have done is, is been trying to challenge that by way of judicial review in the administrative court. Good luck to them, frankly, because it's almost impossible. But these people, it's, it was a, it, it's, it's really miserable and depressing, especially when we have no money left in public services. The easiest way to think yourself through this is, is it relevant this person's got capacity? No, it's completely irrelevant. What happens if this person was standing here saying, I've got capacity, I want this? If the public authority is saying, I won't give it to you, because that is not, I have assessed your needs, I do not give it, need to give it to you to meet those needs, there's no MCA best interest stuff in there at all. In our best interest guides, which I'll show you at the end, we've got a big section at the end on who is the decision maker and the interaction between public law decision making and MCA decision making, because people get so confused. And I'm not, this is not a blamed thing, it's just the way in which the two things interact has been so badly explained by the grown-ups upstairs in DHSC and places, they have set people up to be phenomenally confused, which is really unfair and wrong. This is just to flag up one, one thing, just to flag up very quickly. There's an enormous argument still about when you can remove people from their own homes without going to court or stop them going home from hospital uh, to their own home. Sir James Mumby, the former president of the Court of uh, Protection, at one point got so cross with people being lifted from their own homes and banged into care homes, he said, you're never allowed to do it unless you go to court. At which people, at point everyone went, what? You mean every single time, even when there's no dispute? He was wrong then, and he wasn't trying to say that. What he was trying to say was, if there is a dispute, for God's sake, go to court and get an answer as to whether that's the right thing for the person first, before putting them in the care home and creating facts on the ground. The person getting institutionalised, the, the tenancy being given up. That's what he was trying to say. The reason I put this case up is it reinforces me in my view that if there is no dispute at all, and if there is no disagreement, including taking into account the person's own wishes, that the move into the care home is in their best interests, you absolutely don't need to go to court. Why is this case reinforcing this? This is the case, why, which was decided in July about life-sustaining treatment. Because it had been thought, if you are having artificial nutrition and hydration withdrawn from you, in a permanent vegetative or minimally conscious state, you had to go to court, even if everyone agreed. Supreme Court made it absolutely clear. If the provisions of the MCA are followed, relevant guidance observed, agreement upon what's the best interest of the patient, the patient may be treated in, a, in accordance with that agreement without application to court. So if the court, Supreme Court is saying, you, if there's a proper, true, not manufactured agreement, about what's in that person's best interests. You can withdraw life-sustaining treatment with the effect that they will die, and you can do that without going to court. It follows that if there is proper, genuine, non-manufactured agreement, that it's the right thing for the person to move from their home into a care home, you don't need to go to court. But if there's dispute, or there's a doubt, please don't act first and then go and find a grown-up later. Because there's some awful cases. I've done days having to train GPs on frightening GPs. I remember awful sessions on frightening GPs. I don't know why I was asked to frighten GPs in particular. On all these awful cases like Fluffy, where people act first, think later, 
incarcerate people for months on end in care homes and then have to pay vast amounts of money in damages and more to the point wreak absolute havoc in the lives of the person. But that's just reinforcing you if, the, if, there's, if it's clear it's the right thing and there really is agreement, you don't have to go off to a judge in this sort of situation to get a rubber stamp. So I'm going to whiz very, very quickly through deprivation of liberty. It's all too miserable, and you can find out what's happening. That's the sequence. What we've currently got is the MCA Amendment Bill in the House of Lords had uh, the first day of committee stage. The second day is coming up on the 15th. Those are our slides. That was what the Law Commission said. There was a joint committee. I'm just whizzing through because you've got them all. They, it's skeletal stuff. Joint committee said, could someone please do something about doles? And could someone please also give a statutory definition of deprivation of liberty? They heard from Mark Neary. And one of the biggest and most striking things, I think, in this area, as a lawyer, one might think the whole thing's gone a bit odd. Mark fought the most enormous battle to get his son back from the place he'd been kidnapped to and held in. His son is now in a supported living placement where, as far as anyone can tell, he is happy as Larry. I don't know who Larry is, but Larry is very happy. <laughs> Hillingdon are having to go through the motions of putting in an application to authorise the deprivation of liberty of Stephen in that placement. In law, Stephen is exactly de as exactly deprived of his liberty in this placement he wants to be in as he was in the place he'd been kidnapped and incarcerated in. One might think that is a bit odd, but that is the consequence of the working out of Lady Hale's definition of deprivation of liberty. Joint committee were quite struck by hearing from Mark, and also by Mr. E, the carer for HL. Similar, similar weirdness about the fact that he might be considered, HL might be considered potentially to be deprived of his liberty in the home he's looked after by Mr. and Mrs. E. So. The government didn't introduce the Law Commission's front-end stuff about Section 4 and, and various other things. No definition of deprivation liberty. Um, for some reason, they didn't introduce 16 and 17-year-olds. I'm quite busy at the moment. We're in the Supreme Court tomorrow and Thursday, arguing about whether or not 16 and 17-year-olds can be confined on the say-so of their parents. Also, can they have medical treatment on the say-so of their parents? You might want to watch it, by the way, because it's the first female majority Supreme Court panel ever. Really interesting, really important. Lady Hale, Lady Black, Lady Arden. Three fam the three first, the three Supreme Court justices are female and two others. It's going to be really important on what Gillick means. Really important. That's why there are 13 barristers turning up. Because the government's got involved and all these other people have got involved. Because it covers... Confinement, medical treatment, Gillick competence. It covers all these different bits which are, cover or straddle a range of different things. We know one of the big issues which people have got exercised about is care home managers, their role, not going to comment. Uh, the interface, government said objection should be maintained. In other words, if you object to being an inpatient, you have to use the mental health act. What are we doing now? Well, we think we've got until about 20... About right nine months to royal assent, transition period, so it's at least 2020, probably 2021, before anything comes in. Alongside it, in a way which I only tenuously understand, although I'm the lawyer on it, is the Independent Mental Health Act review, looking at the Mental Health Act and practice. We are reporting late November, early December. We've been asked to look at the interface. Uh, So, can I just leave you with two gaps? What's a one gap and one challenge? There is a gap. There is a real gap for those people who may not lack capacity for purposes of the MCA. The coerced people with the mild impairment. They're in some way vulnerable and they're outside the scope of domestic violence legislation. Or, sorry, that should be domestic abuse, not domestic violence. We've now got really useful stuff like the coercion and control offence, but it doesn't apply to the lodger, to the care worker, to the friend. They're, it just doesn't apply. But the person could be similar, is subject to exactly the same sort of emotional, physical, financial, psychological abuse, control, coercion. If they are said to have capacity and to be choosing it, what on earth do you do? 
It's one of the biggest and most complex areas here. Can I please invite you, the first thing to do is do not rely on the presumption of capacity. Do not say, presumption of capacity, this is this person's choice. You are fundamentally doing a disservice to that person. If there is objective reason to consider this person may lack capacity, you have to investigate and you have to have a reasoned decision as to why you say this person has capacity. Because saying this person has capacity and relying on it to not do anything is just as bad as rampaging around in the person's life on the basis they lack capacity and you haven't thought about it. I really, really want there to be legislation to say what you should be doing here. Because at the moment, you need to go to the High Court under its inherent jurisdiction to say, this person's been coerced, could you help us? No one does it because no one knows what the High Court will do. And it's expensive and it's complicated. Action on elder abuse put in a freedom of information request a while ago about how many local authorities had used it. I think one had. And we do quite a lot in chambers of this kind of stuff. Very, very few people come and say, can we do it? And those who come quite often end up giving up because it's too complicated. And leaving these people in the box marked too complicated. And then very bad outcomes happening. I think we should do this. Law Commission back in 1995 said they should do it. Government currently is uninterested in doing it. Wearing a different hat, I can rant at you for hours about it, but I won't. But it's a really, really big issue in the safeguarding context. But for the time being, please, the number one message from me would be to please don't rely on the presumption of capacity. All it means is you have got to show why the person doesn't have capacity if you're then doing something in the name of their best interest. You do not just walk away. We've got lots of SARS now with horrible outcomes in self-neglect and coercion cases. And then lastly, just to really cheer you all up, we are acting completely unlawfully in this country. Completely unlawfully if you proceed on the basis of the interpretation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Hands up, has anyone heard of this? About three, yep, that's normal. We signed this. This is a convention designed to enable people with disabilities to enjoy rights on the same basis as everybody else. It is overseen by a treaty body of people with disabilities. It is singularly inspiring to watch the UK government turn up in Geneva and have a group of people with disabilities as the UN committee saying, why are you doing what you are doing? How is that for holding people to account? They don't like austerity, unsurprisingly. They really hate the MCA and the Mental Health Act. They really hate it because they say this constitutes unlawful deprivation of people's legal capacity on a false basis. We are saying lots of people are non-people as legal actors because we're saying they lack mental capacity. We will go around doing what we want. They say that is a fundamentally discriminatory approach to take because we wouldn't do it with anyone else. You wouldn't just randomly point at someone and say, I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to take away your decision-making power and do it for you. That is a massive existential challenge. They have said you should abolish all forms of substituted decision-making. In other words, what we do under the MCA concerning all spheres and areas of life by reviewing and adopting new legislation in line with the Convention to in initiate new policies in both mental health and mental capacity law. Just to leave you with that. Government is trying to get its head around it. Independent Mental Health Review is trying to get its head around it. But it's a real challenge. Lastly, resources, our website, all the cases I've talked about, you can find there. The Guide to Capacity, Guide to Best Interest, Deprivation of Liberty, that top one, 13onessex.com, and then some other stuff. And please go and buy all those books, because then I can retire. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you.